For a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. When it came to sex, all powerful kings and queens had the pick of the kingdom for their amorous adventures. But even royals were made fools of by love. England's Henry VIII destroyed Anne Boleyn, the woman he once loved. Prince George and Princess Caroline were a public tragic comedy, and French King Louis XV paid the ultimate price for his wandering eye. They were all consumed by lust. Henry VIII's passionate pursuit of Anne Boleyn is one of the great romantic tragedies. In the end, history was changed and Anne paid the ultimate price for her love. It was here, at Hever Castle in Kent, that a young woman first toyed with the king and ended up playing with fire. In the early 1500s, this perfectly preserved Tudor mansion was home to two little girls, Mary and Anne Boleyn, and their father, Sir Thomas. Anne was the younger, a determined girl who would grow up to be an ambitious and clever young woman. Her less disciplined older sister, Mary, was uninhibited and out for a good time. Sir Thomas, whose grandfather went from humble beginnings to become a wealthy Lord Mayor of London, was a social climber who wanted to move his family even further up the social ladder. He was determined to see his children enter the royal court and rub shoulders with the most powerful people in the land. Sir Thomas had big plans for the social future of his young daughters Mary and Anne. His Anne was to fulfill his every dream and become Queen of England, but at a terrible price. Meanwhile, King Henry VIII was married to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Over the years, the Queen had eight children, but only one, a girl, survived. Desperate for a male heir to succeed him on the throne, Henry began to take on mistresses, and one of the first was Mary Boleyn, Anne's older sister. The King of England often visited Mary at Hever Castle for his trysts. But in 1525, Henry VIII laid eyes on her 25-year-old sister, Anne. The King was smitten from the start. He fell head over heels in love with Anne. Though no great beauty, Anne was said to have eyes which could entrap and bewitch. Used to having his way with women, the king moved quickly to capture Anne and count her as his latest conquest. But Anne was no easy prey and played hard to get. The game of love was joined. To bring her closer to him, Henry appointed Anne maid of honor to Queen Catherine. Anne's calculated response was a provocative promise of delights to come. Love letters between Henry and Anne still exist and show the chase was not going to be easy. The warrant of maid of honor induces me to think that your majesty has some regard for me, since it gives me the means of seeing you oftener and of assuring you by my lips, which I shall do at the first opportunity, that I am your majesty's very obliged and obedient servant without any reserve. Henry was excited unaware of how his long, extraordinary pursuit of Anne's favors would lead him to change his country forever. The more 
and withheld her favors, the more love-struck the king became. Conveniently forgetting he was still a married man, Henry promised he would at least be faithful to Anne. He wrote, I beseech you now, with all my heart, to let me know your whole intention as to the love between us two. For more than a year I have been struck with the dart of love and am not yet sure whether I shall fail or find a place in your heart and affection. If it pleases you to play the part of a true, loyal mistress and friend and to give yourself body and heart to me, I promise to take you for my only mistress, casting all others out of my thoughts and affection and serving only you. In her response, Anne made it clear she was not settling for second best. Your wife I cannot be, both in respect of my unworthiness or not be. Headstrong and wise to the nature of men, Anne knew just what to do to arouse the king's passions. She refused to give herself to Henry. Though the king was raging with lust, she wouldn't allow Henry to touch her. No matter how much the most powerful man in England begged and beseeched, Anne resisted for six years. Her terms were simple, no crown, no sex. Henry's hunger for Anne drove him to drastic measures. He sought a divorce from Catherine, but the Pope refused it. So Henry took a step which would alter the course of British history. In the most dramatic act of his reign, Henry removed his kingdom from the Pope's jurisdiction and put himself at the head of his own church, the Church of England. And the king's first act was to grant himself a divorce from his queen. A free man at last, Henry gained access to Anne Boleyn's bed. To satisfy his lust, Henry had moved history. Henry married Anne in January 1533, when she was already carrying the king's child. The baby was born in September, but it was a girl named Elizabeth. Henry had mortgaged the nation's soul for Anne's love, but he still needed a son. The new queen suffered two miscarriages and a stillborn child. Her failure to bear him a boy now reminded Henry of his royal obligation to produce a male heir. The king's romance with Anne cooled, and he consoled himself with the company of a new woman, Lady Jane Seymour. As he had done to his ex-wife Catherine, he appointed his new romantic interest as maid of honor to Anne. Ready for a new wife, Henry ordered Anne jailed in the Tower of London just three years after they married. She was then sentenced to death on trumped-up charges of adultery and treason. Anne Boleyn, Queen of England, remained proudly defiant to the end, as she wrote to her husband during her last days. Let not your grace ever imagine that your poor wife will ever be brought to acknowledge a fault. Never a prince had wife more loyal in all duty and in all affection you ever found in Anne Boleyn. I see now that the ground of my preferment lay on no surer foundation than your grace's fancy, and the least alteration was sufficient to draw your fancy to some other subject from my doleful prison in the tower. Your most loyal and ever faithful wife, Anne. Henry granted his wife a final favor, knowing English execution. At nine in the morning on May 19, 1536, the Frenchman severed her head with a single blow and held it up to the crowd. Her lips and eyes were seen to move as the crowd, in search of souvenirs, surged forward to dip handkerchiefs in Anne Boleyn's blood. The same day Anne was beheaded, Henry received permission from his hand-picked archbishop to marry Anne's maid of honor, Jane Seymour. He continued his quest for a male heir through three more marriages, but sired only one sickly boy who died at 16. Anne's father, Sir Thomas, died two years later, never knowing that Anne's child, his own granddaughter, would become one of England's greatest monarchs, Queen Elizabeth I. While Henry VIII used drastic means to get rid of Anne Boleyn, 300 years later, England's George IV had a harder time shedding an unwanted wife. His troubles began while he was still Prince of Wales. Young George was a charmless prince, a heavy drinker and a gambler, particularly fond of horse racing. He consistently lost huge sums, owing debt 
equivalent today to tens of millions of dollars. He constructed huge luxury housing for the rich, like these mansions in London's Regent's Park. It was here the prince threw wild parties for his friends, dancing and drinking until dawn. George decorated the exteriors with sensual erotica, some reflecting his preference for older women. The English loathed George, his decadence and indifference to his subjects. His father, the mentally unstable King George III, tolerated his dissolute son until he finally went too far. In 1785, the king discovered his son and heir had secretly married a Mrs. Fitzherbert. Under the constitution, British monarchs were forbidden to marry Catholics or divorcees, and Mrs. Fitzherbert was both. She could never become Queen of England. The king ordered them to separate. But his son would only comply if his gambling debts were cleared. The nation's treasury was forced to cover the prince's huge losses. His secret marriage was then annulled and an official marriage was arranged for the prince. His bride was Princess Caroline of Brunswick. Her portrait was sent to George and met with his approval, but court painters often depicted their subjects in flattering ways. George was in for a surprise. The day before the wedding, George nervously awaited his bride in eager anticipation. She was introduced as his future wife. Prince George was aghast. She was short, fat, smelly, and ruddy-faced. Though no paragon of beauty himself, the prince recoiled, muttering, Ah, oh, I am not well. For heaven's sake, bring me a glass of brandy. George remained drunk throughout his wedding day and had to be propped up at the ceremony. Disconsolate, he wept throughout the entire service. On his wedding night, the inebriated George passed out in the fireplace instead of consummating the marriage. In the morning, he dragged himself to Caroline's bed and performed his royal duty for the first and last time. The fertile princess became pregnant after this solo encounter, but within weeks the couple had separated for good. George remarked to a friend, I'd rather see toads and vipers crawling over me dinner than sit at the same table with her. Cartoonists gleefully rushed to sketch the royal marital farce. George left his wife to return to Mrs. Fitzherbert and a string of matronly mistresses. Spurned by her husband, the vivacious and flamboyant Caroline enjoyed her freedom. She tried on makeup, ate large quantities of onions and drank brandy. She invited friends to her house and many men into her bedroom. She considered sex a happy and healthy activity, describing herself as a little devil in petticoats. I have a bed full of whenever I like. Nothing is more wholesome. Scandalized London society was filled with rumors of Princess Caroline's affairs. It was even said she had another child by a prominent noble, Sir Sidney Smith. But the guileless Princess Caroline didn't realize that Prince George, eager to prove her adultery for a divorce, was spying on her. One of her servants reported to the prince, Mary Wilson said to me how she went into Princess Caroline's bedroom in order to make up the fire. But she found her and Sir Sidney in such an indecent situation that she immediately left the room and was so shocked that she fainted away at the door. The prince's evidence was hearsay, and a special commission found it unconvincing, but vicious court gossip forced Caroline to leave England for an extended tour of Europe. During her visit to Italy, the irrepressible Caroline rode through the streets of Milan in a pink feathered hat and a dress which showed off her ample posterior and stout legs. There, Caroline met her true love, a handsome but penniless Italian adventurer named Bartolomeo Pergami. They traveled together through Europe, making no attempt to disguise their intimacy. Six years later, Caroline learned that King George III had died and her husband had begun. George offered her a king's ransom of more than $2 million a year to stay away, but Caroline refused to be bought off and went back to England. Desperate to get a divorce, George launched an official investigation into Caroline's love life. An English naval officer reported that Caroline switched cabins 
to be next to her lover. An Italian servant testified she made regular visits to her lover's bedroom and that he saw them kiss in public and bathe together in private. Caroline's cook claimed to have caught the couple on a sofa in the throes of love. But tenacious Caroline fought for her position as queen. She hired a tough defence lawyer who publicly hinted at the hypocritical king's own adulterous affair and cowed the witnesses. One witness replied, I do not remember, 87 times. The divorce failed, so in spiteful revenge, George refused to let Caroline attend his coronation. Though a sympathetic public sided with her, the humiliated Caroline lost her will to fight. A few weeks after the coronation, Princess Caroline, a king's wife but never a queen, died from a blockage of the bowel. She had become a victim of love and social hypocrisy, leaving the equally adulterous king to receive a dispensation to finally remarry his old love, Mrs. Fitzherbert. Unlike the public embarrassments of England's Prince George, scandal was no problem in the deliciously decadent French court of Louis XV. There, extramarital affairs were so common they were governed by codes of etiquette. Promiscuity was so widely accepted that the king's principal mistress held an official position in the royal household. Louis's grandfather, son king, Louis XIV, left advice about a monarch's love life. The time we give to our lovers should never be to the detriment of our work, because our primary objective must be the preservation of our glory and authority. When you lose your heart, you must remain in full control of your senses. Keep the caresses of your lovers separate from the responsibilities of kingship. The young king ignored his grandfather's instructions, and in the end, he paid a terrible price for a life devoted to sexual debauchery. Louis XV, whose reign spanned much of the 1700s, was a sexually voracious monarch. He reputedly had over a hundred partners, including everyone from leading courtiers to the lowliest Parisian street girls. Even at state functions, Louis would spot an attractive underage girl in the crowd and order her parents to preserve her virginity for him until she matured. The king's insatiable appetite needed a full-time valet to audition and procure potential royal bedmates. The job was performed by a Monsieur Lebel, whose title was valet de chambre, the official bedchamber attendant. Louis was only 15 when he married a Polish princess. Initially faithful to his bride, he fathered a brood of 10 children in 12 years. But his wife tired of Louis' sexual demands and found any excuse to deny him her bed. Embarking on a hedonistic lifestyle, Louis was so busy with an endless string of mistresses and lovers, he suspended the official public ritual of retiring to bed to have more intimate time with his conquests. The king's first affair was with a woman in his wife's household, the Comtesse de Marie. Avoiding the formal royal bedchamber, he ordered a cosier bedroom built specially for the affair. But then the Comtesse made the mistake of introducing the king to her younger sister. She was cast aside in favor of the fresh conquest, the Duchesse de Vintimille. The glittering corridors and ornate rooms of Versailles were well suited for furtive love. Louis's most famous affair was with a 24-year-old commoner named Jeanne Antoinette Poisson. The couple met at a costume ball, where she arrived dressed as Diana the Huntress. The king was not easily recognized. He and his friends came disguised as yew trees and resembled a 
veritable forest. Meeting Jeanne Antoinette again a few days later, Louis was smitten and moved her into an apartment in Versailles that connected to his bedroom by a secret staircase. The King of France was so taken with her beauty, he transformed her from simple Jeanne Antoinette Poisson into the Marquise de Pompadour. She made a role in formulating foreign affairs. The parade of official mistresses failed to satiate the king, who simultaneously bedded a string of prostitutes and one-night stands. Rumors had it that Louis, accompanied by a pack of hounds, pursued laughing naked young women through the grounds of Versailles. The palace gardens echoed with giggles as the panting King of France chased his prey. A house in the palace grounds was fitted out as a brothel to accommodate the royal harem, which Louis would visit disguised as a Polish nobleman. Despite precautions to protect Louis from his worst excesses, even the King of France paid a horrendous price for so much license. Louis XV contracted smallpox, aggravated by what was called the French disease, syphilis. His skin erupted in oozing sores, and he suffered an agonizing death. His corpse was so rotten, the undertakers skipped embalming it and immediately destroyed it in quicklime. For Louis XV, the Cupid of love had aged into the grim reaper of death. Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, Prince George and Princess Caroline, French King Louis XV with his countless lovers, all were star-crossed royals. All their power and wealth couldn't change the capricious ways of love. In the end, the royal privilege of unrestrained passion proved the downfall of many a monarch when they became slaves to lust. Sir Thomas, whose grandfather went from humble beginnings to become a wealthy Lord Mayor of London, was a social climber who wanted to move his family even further up the social ladder. 
He was determined to see his children enter the royal court and rub shoulders with the most powerful people in the land. Sir Thomas had big plans for the social future of his young daughters Mary and Anne. His Anne was to fulfill his every dream and become Queen of England.